Good morning. morning. Welcome to Faith Presbyterian Church. We are so uh, glad that you're here and and honored and privileged to have you come and and, uh, worship with us. Uh, We hope you feel welcome and and hope that the Lord would bless you this morning. Um, I'd like to also uh, extend a happy Father's Day uh, to all the fathers uh, among us. If you're visiting also from from uh, out, of, out of the area, we want to welcome you as well. What a wonderful gift um, God gives to us in our earthly fathers, uh, who um, in various ways point us to our perfect heavenly father. And, uh, and, re- and we, we, under- we get our first taste of what it means to be a child, uh, a son or a daughter uh, of a father, um, through our earthly fathers. So, happy Father's Day to you. Uh, Just a few announcements uh, this morning. You know, please keep uh, the various people in prayer. Um, You can see it on the top of of page 8. Tony Smiles was recently uh, admitted to the hospital for appendicitis, and he'll be in the hospital for a few more days. Uh, Please continue to pray for Vacation Bible School, for all the the kids and and the families who will be joining us uh, later on in, the, in, in July, uh, as well as uh, all the staff and volunteers. Um, VBS is one of uh, our most important outreaches. Uh, we want to, um, to share the love of Jesus and the knowledge of God and the gospel, and one of the most important ways we do that is through Vacation Bible School. Um, I myself uh, remember fondly the truths that I was taught when I was at VBS, and it was those truths that the Lord kind of brought back into my mind when I first became a Christian. And so it has a very, very important place in my own life, my own uh, journey to faith. And so I want to invite you all to pray and for all of you to uh, invite uh, your friends and neighbors and their children as well. Uh, you can also see the various um, announcements. There's men's community group coming up uh, this week, uh, the Faith Family Campout, and the Inquirer's class that begins a week from today during the Sunday school hour. But before um, we begin our worship, I'd like to invite uh, Flaubert Medina to give us a missions report on Uganda. morning. Uh, I'm here to give you uh, an update on the OP mission in Uganda. And as you know, we support um, several missionary families in Uganda that include the Robins, the Van Essendelfs, the Wrights, the Bardmans, the Jacksons, and the uh, Tuningas. Now, given the size and scope of the uh, mission work, I'm only providing you with an update on the overall mission rather than on individual families. The OP Uganda mission operates the Knox School of Theology, the Reformation Book Room, the Akision Ayesu Presbyterian Clinic, or the uh, Compassion of Jesus Clinic. They also uh, are responsible for the Timothy Discipleship Program, and they assist on the Presbyterian the Assisted Presbyterian Church of Uganda in church planting and leadership training. The mission is active in two areas, uh, Karamoja and Mbale. Members serving on the Karamoja station labor in the areas of evangelism, church planting, uh, leadership training, village Bible instruction, liter- uh, literature production, um, literacy, training as well as medical care through the work of the Akision Yesu Presbyterian Clinic. They also do community health instruction and other works of mercy, such as the operation of a farm. Now in Mbale, members work with the indigenous OP church uh, for the purpose of facilitating the uh, the formation of a mature, grace-empowered, self-sufficient body. Now one of the biggest Um, needs in Africa is for pastoral education. 
Eight years ago, there were only three ordained pastors in the presbytery, and none had degrees or degree-level training in theology. Today, through the efforts of our missionaries at Knox Theological College, there are nine ordained pastors and 22 official students, and many others who audit courses. Most students come from a Presbyterian or Pentecostal background, and many of the Pentecostal brothers have come to see the glory and beauty of a Christ-centered theology, which leads to healthy preaching and leadership. The local church is flourishing, and the Lord has called men to the office of elders and deacons for the first time. Leadership training include discussing God's call, the qualifications for office, the functions of the various roles, and the scriptural foundations of biblical church government. In addition, the men learn to pray for all the members, and they role play uh, evangelistic, apologetic, and counseling situations. Elder and deacon training may take over a year, and further training may be necessary after that. They hope to certify some of the nominees and will ask the congregation to vote on who should serve as their church officers. And they are filled with joy to have their first Karamojang church leaders. Although the men in leadership training have confessed Christ and have repented of past sins, they're growing and growing in biblical and pastoral wisdom. These men are also experiencing powerful trials. Several have been afflicted with illness, and another has had to deal with family members or family problems involving the police. So these men are being tested. So please pray that their faith would not fail, and that Christ would sustain them, be honored in them, and be honored by them. The church is also witnessing the Lord's multiplying power at work. The Lord has sent the church young men who love the scriptures, and who want to walk with the Lord. There were those who show serious interest in becoming pastors and evangelists, but the lack of education makes the students unprepared for theological and pastoral training. In response, the Timothy Discipleship Training Program was established to provide these young men with a strong high school education that integrate a discipleship program with ongoing biblical uh, teaching and training. So please pray that the Lord will send the school more academically uh, able men who are serious about loving the Lord and obeying his word. Karamoja is a very uh, needy region where people depend on farming and they have to work very hard to earn very little. Over the years, the OP mission has uh, cultivated the fields with the intent of creating work, teaching sustainable farming techniques, uh, introducing new crops, food aid, and discipleship of workers. However, with the dry season lasting longer than usual, plowing and planting have been much delayed and has made it extremely difficult for the Karamojong people to provide food for their family. Please remember to pray for the people who are now hungry due, due to the prolonged dry season and pray for a successful planting season that farming techniques would bear much fruit for better equipment and certainly for rain. In Mbali, another way the mission shares the gospel is through the uh, Reformation book room and coffee shop. The book room has become a wonderful oasis of excellent theology and good coffee, as well as a place for live music and local crafts. The book room has a catalog of almost 2,000 books of theological and Christian literature. It is becoming a common coffee shop for safari companies on their way to Mount Elgon, and it offers a tremendous opportunity to share the gospel. Pray that many will hear the gospel through, the, the, through their visits at the Reformation Book Room and come to know Christ. Now, the uh, Accision Ayesu Presbyterian Clinic, or the Compassion of Jesus Clinic, uh, it exists to deliver quality medical health care in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Providing medical care has been a tremendous oppor opportunity to help the people and to share the gospel. 
Although there may be clinics that are nearby, many families are choosing to come to the clinic to deliver their babies since the hiring of a midwife. This has encouraged more mothers to deliver in the clinic instead of their homes, and they are taught good hygiene practices in the care for their newborn babies, and to educate them about immunization and other hygiene practice, immunization and other healthcare needs. In addition to the services provided at the facility, uh, the clinic has a community health program where teachers go into the villages to teach people in their new homes about basic health and hygiene, uh, recent epidemics, common diseases, or other health concerns. The medical and spiritual care given by the Compassion of Jesus Clinic bring honor to Jesus, the great physician. So Uganda is at the crossroads for Islam and Christianity, and it also a, a tremendous focus of foreign investment. Although it is about the size of Oregon, Uganda has more than 10 times the population of Oregon. By 2050, its population is projected to reach more than 105 million people. China has invested tremendously in the country by building roads and factories, and Muslim nations have also been building hospitals, schools, and mosques. So please remember to pray that we as Christians may see the importance of Uganda. If the Church of Jesus Christ can be strong in this land, it will impact all of Africa and the world. Thank you. As uh, Joseph makes his way up, he is our, our uh, new intern. Um, and and, uh, as, and just w one more quick announcement. Um, if you're visiting us for the first time, uh, if you would fill out a welcome card on the back of the pew in front of you and put it in the offering basket later on the service uh, so that we know you came, uh, that would be wonderful. So Joseph will give us the call to worship. Please stand and hear your, your Lord call you to worship with his word. The call to worship today is from Psalm 100. A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to Yahweh, all the earth. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that Yahweh, he is good. He is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For Yahweh is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, you are good. You have made us, and we are yours. Lord, would that you would rend the heavens and come down. You promise to be with your people as we, as we come before you in corporate worship. Lord, we thank you for calling us out of this kingdom of darkness, Lord, and transferring us. You've transferred us into the kingdom of marvelous light, into the kingdom of your Son, Lord, bless us with your spirit, make your face shine upon us, give us listening ears and receptive hearts, that we might hear and believe and obey your word joyfully out of new hearts that you alone can provide. Lord, please accept our, our worship of praise through the mediation of your very Son. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening song of praise, thy word.
Now, if you would uh, open your, your uh, red Trinity hymnals in front of you, if you would turn with me to page 803 as we have the res- responsive reading of Psalm 47. Page 803. Uh, this is a psalm of, uh, another psalm of kingship where we praise the Lord for, for being not only God but our king and uh, how everything else is under his lordship. So I'll read the regular print and you'll respond with the bold and we'll say the last line together. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord of Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He shows our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble us, the people of of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Now the uh, choir will bring us the anthem. Thank you, choir. Junior Church is now dismissed at this time. So now we we come to one of the uh, most important means of grace, uh, the ways in which the Lord calls us to appropriate uh, His saving grace, the gospel of his grace to us. And one of the most important ways 
is to pray, to really ask him for grace. So let's unite our hearts together and exercise that wonderful privilege we have as the children of God to go to him as we pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are near to all who call upon you, who all who call upon you in, in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you that you are the triune God, a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the three person in one God, one substance, uh, equal in power and in glory. We thank you that you created the heavens and the earth simply by speaking, and you said, let it be, and so it was. We thank you that you made the stars, and you placed each and every star, uh, the billions and billions, uh, Lord, the innumerable, uncountable, uh, seemingly infinitesimal number of stars in the galaxy, and you placed each and every one of them exactly where they are supposed to be. You've put all the planets in its right places, all the solar systems and galaxies, and uh, Lord, in, in the fullness of your your creation you created uh, the earth and the heavens uh, you you uh, made the sun the moon and the stars and you made uh, the the uh, creatures of the air and on the earth and under the earth in the waters but lord we thank you that you created uh, the apex the crowning glory of your creation when you created humanity when you created us out of the dust of the earth, you made us in your likeness and in your image, and you breathed the breath of life into us, and we became living beings created to have fellowship and to commune and to know you. Father, we thank you that you made us uh, so fearfully and wonderfully, that you put eternity into our hearts, that you knew the end from the beginning, and you've given us a, a desire for that, a desire to, to know you and to live with you forever and ever. But Lord, in our own selfish, selfishness and sin, we rebelled against you. In Adam and Eve, uh, Lord, we sinned and fell short of your glory, uh, not only receiving it through our um, descent from, from Adam and Eve, but also we have committed sins uh, in our fallenness, in our desire to, to be God unto ourselves, to, um, to go our own way, thinking that what we do is right, rather than considering what, what you want us to do. Uh, Lord, we, we confess that we have sinned in so many ways, in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, strength, soul, and mind. We have Look to other things as our gods, as, as idols, as, as counterfeit deities, putting our hope, faith, trust, and peace and identity in them. And they have, they have failed us so miserably in so many ways. We feel the emptiness of putting our hopes in anything less than, than, than God. And uh, we, we feel it in broken relationships. We, we feel it in in the lack of, of meaning and hope and, and, uh, and joy in life. We feel it in, in the brokenness of, of our own lives, in our marriages, in our relationships with our children and friends, and even in our community, and even among nations where there is conflict and war. Father, we pray, we also confess that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, that we have thought of ourselves first, and, uh, and everyone else after. And we've been self-centered, and that has come up in so many ways in the way that we speak to those around us, in the ways that we've acted, in the things that we've done. We have committed um, so many heinous uh, acts to, that hurt the ones that we love the most. Uh, when we've, we've hurt them and, um, and sinned against them in so many ways, deep ways. Lord, would you forgive us of all of our sins? Would you cleanse us from all of our trespasses? Would you forgive us of all of our debts as we confess them to you? That you've promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and to heal us and make us whole. Father, we thank you for the gospel we thank you for the mercy and the merits that come through Jesus Christ, who didn't deserve anything, 
uh, any, any of the, the, the ills that came upon him. He didn't deserve the wrath and the condemnation. He didn't deserve the lashes. He didn't deserve the mocking. He didn't deserve the punishment that he received on the cross, but he did it for us. He pulled us out of the way and took our place and suffered our guilt and wrath and shame so that our sins would be once and for all forgiven. That when he was forsaken, he was forsaken on our behalf so that we might be accepted and received once and for all, adopted as your children forever and ever. And so, Lord, through that mercy and merit on the cross, we come to you asking that you would continue to work in our lives, heal us, continue to forgive us, continue, Lord, to help us uh, let go and turn from those sins that make us stumble so often, those sins that we, we pound in our chest wondering why, why can't we let them go? Why do they keep bothering us? Why do we keep struggling with them? Why do we keep hurting other people with our words and with the way that we are? Lord, would you help us and change us, make us more like Jesus, to humble us, to make us more compassionate, to uh, love others as he loved us, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to lay down our lives uh, for the benefit and the blessing of those that we love the way that he did that for us. Lord, would you make us nothing, more, no, nothing short of more and more like Jesus in each and every way. Father, we pray, Lord, as we come boldly to your throne of grace for, for help in our time of need, would you, would you hear our prayers for our church, that we would continue to be Christ-centered, God-glorifying, and gospel-sharing. Uh, Help us to be a community centered upon your grace in Jesus Christ. Uh, a, a community that loves one another because you have first loved us. Help us, Lord, as we pray for our community. There are so many uh, difficulties and, and, um, and problems in our community. Broken families, broken marriages, broken lives through addiction, uh, mental health, um, sins of our own uh, doing. Lord, would you help us to reach out to our community, to love them, to care for them, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray for our local government. We pray for Mayor Garcia, for council uh, persons, uh, Roberto Uranga, Rich, Rex Richardson, and, um, and Al Austin. We pray, Lord, for our state government, for uh, Governor Newsom, our legislature. We pray for the federal government, President uh, uh, Trump and, and Vice President Pence and Congress and, and, uh, and the Supreme Court and the judicial branches. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help them to rule with wisdom, compassion, justice, and equity so that, that uh, we might live quiet and peaceable lives and uh, that our fellow uh, citizens would, would as well and that it would be the wonderful environment for us to love our neighbor and to share the gospel with them. Lord, we pray for, for those who are sick and ill among us. Lord, those with acute and chronic uh, diseases, we pray that you would help them and heal them, give their doctors wisdom to care for them and the nurses to have compassion as they take care of them. Father, we pray for our young people. Uh, Lord, from from the little ones all the way up to, to our young people um, in their early 20s, we pray, and even beyond, that you would be their God. You would keep them pure. You would help them to grow in the nurture and the admonition of your, your grace and of your covenant. We pray for, for you to fulfill the promise of their baptism, that, that, that as they are being raised in the covenant, they would own the covenant for themselves and put their faith in Jesus Christ and profess him to all the world. Father, as we continue on in the service, would you uh, receive the giving of our tithes and of our offerings, that, it would, that we would give them cheerfully, that you would use them for the grace, for the growth and glory of your Son. Bless us, Lord, as we continue on in the service. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. The ushers may now take the morning offering. <coughs>
If you turn with me in your hymnals to number 170, as we sing our uh, hymn of thanksgiving, Fairest Lord Jesus, if you're able, please stand. We will sing hymn number 170, Fairest Lord Jesus. Well, if you would um, turn with me in your Bibles this morning, we continue um, through uh, a short series to the Psalms, the Royal Psalms of Kingship. These are the Psalms uh, in the Bible that speak to the kingship of, of God and, and His anointed, the, the, the coming Messiah. And, and so we're just going to look at various aspects of of what that means, the various ways in which uh, God is king and the various attributes that he he expresses uh, because he is king. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 45, it is, um, it's good to be back. I, um, you know, this past week, just recovering from last week's cold, and so I just thank you for for being so welcoming and receptive to uh, a last-minute guest preacher last week. So, um, uh, and uh, Andrew is a, a good friend, and I was just really glad that you got a chance to hear him he, uh, as a professor of Old Testament from Mid-America Seminary in Indiana. If you would pray for me, um, you know, as, we, as I'm during this uh, time, I've, so my voice doesn't go out, <clears throat> And I hope it doesn't go out. Um, maybe this will spare you uh, my, uh, my uh, higher volume during more animated t- points in the sermon. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we hear his word. Let's go. Let's, uh, let's ask him for his help. Our Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come and to dwell in our hearts, to give us ears to hear and eyes to see your word as it is read and particularly as it is preached. 
Be with your people as they hear that they might see Jesus. Be with me, your servant, as I preach that I may proclaim Jesus. So that in this wonderful moment, Jesus might be magnified. Bless us, O Lord, on this Father's Day, that this is one of the ways in which you provide manna from heaven for your weak and needy children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, brothers, and sisters, hear now the reading of God's word, beginning in verse 1. To the choir master, according to Lilies, a maskeel of the sons of Korah, a love song. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. In your splendor and majesty, in your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the riches of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber, with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of your fathers shall shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. On May 19th, 2018, uh, the BBC introduced their live coverage of the royal wedding between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle with a commissioned poem by George the Poet. It was a royal poem about marriage, and what a fitting poem it was to introduce this magnificent uh, ceremony for the third in line to the throne of England. He says this at the beginning. He said, there's an indescribable beauty in union in two beings forming one new being, entering each other's world, surrendering each other's selves. Throughout history, kings and governments have commissioned poets and bards, bards to to, uh, to write songs and poems fitting to frame the occasion, to elevate it in majesty and honor, to be remembered for ages to come. And what we see this morning is an exact example of that in the Bible, that there is a royal poet, a royal psalmist, who was commissioned to write a song to frame the occasion of the marriage of a king. This is a royal psalm for a royal wedding, talking about the nature of kingship and queenship. Uh, This morning I'm just going to um, uh, preach on the first nine verses, um, on the, on the, the, uh, the royal bridegroom, if you will, as he stands uh, awaiting 
uh, the coming of his royal bride. And, uh, and then in the future, uh, I'll uh, preach the, uh, the second half of it. But if you would look with me in verse 1, to the choir master, according to Lily's a masquil of the sons of Korah, a love song. Uh, what a wonderful way to introduce a, a, a wedding song as a love song. My heart overflows, says the psalmist, with a pleasing theme. This is, it's, it's an occasion that is so overwhelming to him. He can't help but to, um, to uh, put, put words to, to pen. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. It just, it just out of the fullness of the, of, of the heart comes words. And, and, and that's what he's saying here. He's just overwhelmed by the occasion that he can't help but write these verses. And he begins by addressing it to the king, the royal bridegroom, as he waits for his bride. And so let's look at who this king is. What, what does the royal psalmist say about the bridegroom on his wedding day? First, he is a royal bridegroom filled with grace and majesty. The psalmist tells us two things in particular about this king. Look at, look at verse 2 with me. He is a king of royal grace. Uh, he has poise and power and majesty and honor. He has a presence that is befitting a king. Right? It would make no sense, or at least it, wouldn't, it would not be as beautiful in an occasion if, uh, if the king of Israel looked like, uh, uh, looked like a, a, a pauper or a peasant. He, he needs to, to look the part because he is the part. So he is a king of royal grace, decked out on his wedding day. Um, if the king is the most uh, powerful, the most important person in the kingdom, then, then he ought to look that way. And you can look at it in verse 2. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. He is the most good-looking um, you know, and it's interesting, too, that any, any slob on his wedding day can clean up and look good. How much more so uh, is that the case for the king of Israel? And, uh, and so he's, he's decked out in royal wedding garb. And, uh, and not only is he handsome, or not only is he uh, good-looking and, and majestic in, in, uh, in his, in, as he stands there, uh, uh, majestic, he's filled with words of grace, right? Not only is he look, filled with, look with grace, but he speaks with grace. The psalmist goes on, he says, grace is poured upon your lips. That, and, um, and this has the idea of, of speaking in such a way that people listen, right? He has a poise about him where he speaks and, and you can tell he is king. Uh, maybe it's in the manner in which he speaks with an elevated honor and majesty. Or maybe it is with the wisdom with which he speaks, right? That he is a king who knows how to rule well. And, and the people trust him. Uh, the people hear him. They're persuaded by him. So when he speaks, everyone listens. Or maybe it's with the actual grace with which he speaks, that he is not a harsh king, he is not a tyrant or a dictator, but he is like a loving heavenly father, loving father who speaks to his people as a, as a loving father to children who need to hear from him, children who need to be guarded and guided and protected. Um, on this Father's Day, some of, some of us were raised, had, have fathers who spoke with grace. Even when we were in trouble, the grace on their lips oozed from their, from their mouths. And uh, even when they, were, when they were reprimanding us and rebuking us, we still knew that they loved us. Uh, or maybe we were raised by fathers who didn't have as much grace uh, in the way that they spoke. And maybe they spoke ill of us. Maybe they, they spoke down upon us. Maybe they spoke in a way that belittled us. 
And so maybe in this way, we look to an ideal that there is someone with grace who can speak to us in our need and in our weaknesses. And for the people of Israel, that person was, at least in front of them, this king filled with grace from his lips. And uh, ultimately, not only was he eloquent and well-spoken to persuade these people to live in, in a more elevated, higher, more, more honorable way, but ultimately kings were meant to be earthly representatives of the true king, the heavenly king, God, Yahweh, the Lord himself. And so it does reflect, even you know, as the king spoke with grace, the grace that would have come from the lips of God. And he is all of these things because the, the earthly king is, is all of these things because it has been given to him by God. Therefore, God has blessed you forever, says the psalmist. He is not only filled with grace, but he is also a mighty king filled with splendor and majesty. He is a warrior king, right? One of the, the ancient ways in which kings were understood or seen by their people was as protector, as a warrior king who, who was vigilant to watch over his people who were um, open to attacks by outside forces, uh, who were open to oppression by other nations. And so it was the king who was uh, the sovereign over the armies and the military. Um, and, uh, and so the same goes here for the king of Israel. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. It is, it is the fact that he is a warrior king uh, that, that uh, makes him so majestic, that he has a record of protecting his people from those who would do their kingdom harm. They were not only rulers of the government, but generals, supreme commanders of the armies. And, uh, and so if, if, if this is the case, right, if, if an essential part of what a king does is as a military commander, then, um, then very much like my friends who are in the military, I don't know if you've ever been to a military wedding, but it is something wonderful to behold, to see them decked out in their military uh, formal garb, with their stripes, with their, with their uh, medals, uh, with their shiny, shiny patent leather boots, uh, with, with their fellow um, soldiers uh, and their swords. Um, some of the most uh, interesting weddings have been uh, military weddings. And so how much more so is then that the case for the supreme commander, the king, of Israel. It must have been quite a sight to behold. Um, if, you, if you watched uh, Prince Harry's wedding, you saw he didn't wear a tuxedo. He didn't wear a suit like his, his, uh, his groomsmen. He wore his military formal uniform because he, um, he uh, was a military officer. Not only is he a mighty king, but he is a righteous and humble king. In your majesty, the psalmist says, write out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. He's not just a mighty king, but he is a righteous king. He's not just celebrating a marriage, but he's also celebrating a victory. He fights for what is right and good. And this is why, for example, in the law of God, there was a provision for the kings of Israel to have their own copy of God's word to read it on a regular basis, to know it, to incorporate it, to let it shape their hearts and their minds and their thinking so that they would become kings after God's own heart, filled with righteousness and justice, compassion and goodness. And, um, and so when you marry the two things, when you have this mighty king of, 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 of a warrior king, married to a mighty king that is righteous and good, you have a, a, a wonderful combination. Something to celebrate over. Something to praise the king for. And not only is... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> not only is he 
righteous, uh, but he is meek, he is humble. And he is riding out for the cause of humility here in righteousness. This is important because true righteousness, true goodness and justice shouldn't make us proud or haughty. It shouldn't make us um, hard to be around because we're always pointing out people's flaws and shortcomings, always making judgments. Oh, you know, this person doesn't live that way and they, they're, they're falling short in so many ways. No, true, true righteousness, true attention to God's ways that are good and right. We shouldn't be pointing, necessarily be pointing out other people's sins until and unless we've pointed out and are aware of our own sins. And therefore, people who know what is right ought to be the most humble in all of God's kingdom. And that's why it's so amazing here that he is not only righteous, right? He's not only writing out victoriously in majesty for the cause of truth and righteousness, but, verse 4, and meekness. And meekness. Um, this reminds us of how important it is then to be not only be holy in our outlook, but to be humble in our demeanor. And we'll see these qualities of kingship that points us uh, to the qualities that we will come to see in the true king of David, the true king of, of holiness and humility, in the coming king, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both perfectly righteous and just in, in all that he is and all that he did, but also, he had that wonderful, wonderful character of grace and humility. This reminds me of uh, the wonderful praise song by Graham Kendrick, where he puts it so well. He says, meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God. Lord of eternity dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. Bow down and worship, for this is your God. This is, this is an ideal king of Israel who comes finally in the meekness and majesty of Jesus. This also reminds us as believers of what Randy Alcorn calls the paradox of grace and truth. This is how we as Christians ought to live, not only be, because righteousness ought to humble us, but also because Jesus was all of these things and we emulate his character. And so we hold both of these truths, grace and truth, holiness and humility together in our person. I like the way Randy Alcorn puts it this way. He says, grace and truth found their perfect union in Christ. But the rest of us tend to gravitate towards one or the other. Truth without grace breeds self-righteousness and legalism. Grace without truth breeds deception and moral compromise. The key to true Christian spirituality is to integrate these two qualities in life, thus imitating the character of Christ. I want to encourage you to, to uh, work towards that, that wonderful harmony that Jesus had, to be gracious, humble, and be holy and, and just at the same time. Uh, let's move on. Fourthly, he is also a conquering king. Look at look verse 5 there. <clears throat> Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, the people fall under, your, under you. His arrows pierce deep into the heart of his enemies and the people fall under him. This is, this is, this is no um, uh, paper uh, warrior king. Now, in our day and age, the language of military victory and conquering sounds militaristic, uh, which in, in some cases it is, Right? If, if all we talk about is how many countries we've conquered, how many people we've 
we've overcome and put under the, 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 uh, the, uh, the power of, of a nation, um, that would not necessarily be a great thing for, people to, for nations and people to brag about. But this is the language of winning people over in the context of a, of a uh, holy and humble king who fights for righteousness and truth and is meek in himself. He's winning people over with truth and justice. And so, for example, then, when we see grave injustices and evils in the world perpetrated against our fellow human beings, we want our government to intervene. Um, when, when, when people found out that there were millions and millions of, of Jews being, um, being killed in the Holocaust, um, the conscience of, of the country pushed to help them, to free them, to save them. Right? That, that's why we, part of the reason why we entered into World War II, uh, to end the Nazi Holocaust and the genocide of the Jews. This is what we did in sending UN peacekeepers to stop the Rwandan genocide uh, and, and, the, and the genocides uh, in, in uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia. This is what pushed us to send humanitarian troops to guard the humanitarian aid when there was uh, anarchy and lawlessness uh, after earthquakes in Haiti and Venice and, and even sending uh, aid to Venezuela. This is part of, of uh, why uh, that we sent UN peacekeepers to, to help the South Koreans against an invading northern communist uh, invasion. If you see God's kingship as righteous and just, then of course we will want him to fight for justice and to stop evil in the world. And that's what the psalmist is describing here. This, uh, in many ways, this just reminds me of, of C.S. Lewis's um, section, the passage in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that, that when you have a good, good king who is powerful, he doesn't necessarily conform to what we think um, a king should be. He, he's like, um, like uh, C.S. Lewis writes, he's, he ought to be like Aslan, the Christ figure, powerful, unpredictable according to our um, ideas. But because he is good, he is good. He, he's um, in the scene with Mr. Beaver, describing Aslan, this, this Christ figure lion, to uh, little Susie. Uh, he says this, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's, he's the king, I tell you. Um, that's, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the psalmist who's reflecting a righteous and yet humble and yet powerful king the way that he is, not the way that we would want him to be. And we'll see the psalmist here describing then a, a messianic ideal king who has yet to come into existence uh, in the history of, of Israel and the king, the sons of David. And we don't see it fully realized until the coming of Jesus. These words are fulfilled in, in, when he comes, when he comes in the fullness of time, who was, who was humble, yet a mighty king, who came for the cause of grace and truth, yet in meekness and majesty, to conquer a people for himself, not with sharp arrows of war, but with heart-piercing words of love and grace. He won them over, and, and the people fell under him, calling him Lord and Savior. There's a, a, a countercultural way in which the gospel conquers people's hearts, conquers whole nations, and will conquer the whole world through the weapons of love and grace in the gospel.
As we'll see, the psalmist, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, and, and, uh, and the way that he backs up these words that conquer us in love is when he came to bear our sins, to suffer the penalty and the punishment that we deserved, and to die on a cross, and to rise from the dead after three days to then give us his life-giving um, existence and resurrection power and the idea is perfectly captured in that hymn when he rode in humble majesty riding a donkey into jerusalem on that palm sunday the the, the hymn writer says this ride on ride on in majesty hark all the tribes hosanna cry O savior meek pursue your road with palms and scattered garments strode Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp ride on to die. O Christ, your triumphs now begin, o'er captive death and conquered sin. See, he's not just a royal bridegroom of grace and splendor, but he's also a glorious bridegroom, betrothed and divine. Let's continue on here. You can see verses 6 on. That under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist calls this king. He addresses him directly, and look at what he calls him. He calls him God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is a reference to the eternal nature, not only of God's promise to, to the kings of David, that a descendant would sit on a throne forever, but the psalmist here also speaks to him directly as God because his kingdom, if his throne is forever, it is because he himself is forever. And uh, not only that, but he bears the character of God. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. This is language spoken over and over again almost word for word, throughout the Psalms and throughout the Old Testament, of the nature of God's royal, heavenly, divine kingship, of of hating wickedness and loving righteousness. And uh, we see this as well as an Old Testament glimpse, a a foreshadowing of, of the triune nature of God in the Old Testament. That when we think of the doctrine of the Trinity, of the three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, distinct in person, but one in substance in Godhead, uh, equal in power and glory, it's not just the New Testament doctrine that that we kind of came up with uh, out of thin air. It is something that, that we read passages particularly like this, where where. Uh, a king, a man, is directly addressed as God in the context of a prayer to God. Right? And, uh, and so, so not, you know, without a doctrine of, of the Trinity, you, this, this passage makes no sense. Look at verse 7. Therefore God, your God. Right? He's saying, therefore God, the king, your God has anointed you with oil of gladness beyond your, comp- your companions. See that? It, this reminds me of, of the New Testament passages where, where people challenge Jesus, you know, do you think that the Messiah is the son of David? And, and Jesus, trying to, you know, trying to teach them and imply and, and hinting at the divine nature of the Messiah, he says, how can the Messiah be David's son when Dave himself calls the Messiah Lord, when he said, the Lord said to my Lord? See, so he's, he's hinting at the, the divine nature of this Messiah, and here the psalmist is saying the same thing. Therefore, God, this king, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. So he is as well God. Um, and the writer of Hebrews pointedly and specifically quotes these verses to show that Jesus is God. Right? Who, else has, who else does it say that he, is, he was made um, greater than angels? Who else 
uh, is, is, a, uh, is God like Jesus? And then he quotes these verses. Your throne, O God, is forever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Um, he's also an anointed king uh, as a royal bridegroom waiting for his bride. Look at, look at, look at these verses here. He's, he's decked out for a wedding. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Uh, he, his clothes, he, this is all kind of like, you know, all of his clothes have been uh, prepared with the finest of, of fragrances and um, of, of, of spices. Music is playing in the background, right? This is the uh, procession, the waiting music, if you will, as he stands there. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Now look who's, who's all around him. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. You know, this woman is not a, an ordinary queen, a, an ordinary lady. He, she is wearing the finest gold known in the ancient world, the, the gold of Ophir. And the Messianic king has been anointed by God, and, and at the same time, he is anointed to be king and at the same time be married, to be a husband. And what's interesting here is that the psalmist's vision is never fully realized in the life of David nor any of his, his descendants after him. Solomon, his son, came probably the closest Right? He was wealthy and wise beyond all imagination. And all of his many brides were no doubt daughters of royalty. But it is in that particular uh, circumstance where Solomon falls short. Uh, he had many wives and not just one. Whereas this king fixes his eyes and is, is being prepared to marry one royal bride that all the other kings after Solomon fell short of God's glory, falling into sin and idolatry and adultery and compromise. They felt, not only fell outward, but, but they fell inward in, in their moral majesty. Right? There's, nothing more, there's nothing more demeaning of a person's stature when they have fallen morally. And that's what the kings of Israel did over and over again in the, in, in the Old Testament. And it only continued downhill until, until, the, until the, everything was so compromised that the kings were not different at all than the pagan kings of the kingdoms around them. And there was a division in the kingdom. And finally, God demonstrated that to, to let them be who they wanted to be, which was like the other nations, so he gave them over to the other nations, and there was exile. And, there, and the people of Israel waited and longed for a king who would be exactly like this king here in Psalm 45. And in the fullness of time, one greater than David, one greater than Solomon, one greater than any of David's son came into the world, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might save those who are under the law. What we see here is an anointing of a divine king in his wedding for his royal bride at his right hand, and the way Jesus did this was to humble himself, to serve and not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many, to give his life to redeem a fallen, sinful bride and to cleanse her and redeem her and make her beautiful, bright, pure, whiter than snow. You see, this is ultimately our wedding song, our marriage celebration to our handsome king bridegroom our glorious divine savior who is king of kings and lord of lords came to redeem us from our sins to cleanse us and to make us clean heavenly perfect brides that's what redemption is that is the uh, the gospel that is proclaimed to you this morning this is ultimately fulfilled when Jesus finishes what he started and he comes back then to claim all who put their trust in him. He will come back to claim his glorious bride that he is gathering for himself. And that's what you and I all are 
We who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we who have said, not only do I do to being betrothed to Jesus, but we will all together say, I do, and we will become the bride of Jesus when he returns. That we will, in now in principle, because Jesus is our betrothed husband, we are in him, and we are in him at God's right hand, because Jesus is at God's right hand. And now we live in a time where, where the call of the gospel invitation to come and to, to, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to be one with him, to be his bride, he is giving that to you, offering that to you. You know, you all have sins that I'm sure you are struggling with. Maybe you're saying to yourself, you know, how can, how can anyone love me for the things that I've done? How can anyone love me for, for the, the ugliness that I am? I have fallen so short. I'm self-centered. Uh, I have a short temper. I um, think only of myself first. Or maybe, maybe you think that, that you're uh, God's gift to the whole world and you don't see how self-centered you really are. And maybe you also need to, uh, to see that, that you are, um, that you deserve, that you are undeserving of God's love and grace. But yet, in the, in the gospel, he loves you and he will make you deserving. He will wash you and cleanse you and make you whiter than snow. He will put on, take off your dirty, filthy rags of your own righteousness. And he will put upon you the clean, white, pure garments befitting a virgin bride. And he will invite you as the music is playing as he stands majestic and meek, holy and, and rejoicing and humble, and he calls you to himself. And you will say to him, oh, handsome, handsome king, I come to you. And this is the great hope and the promise that, and the vision of the gospel, uh, marriage, marriage of, the, of the lamb that he, that he gives to us at the end in Revelation 16, 9, 6 to 9. The voice of a great multitude crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with, with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This is our wedding song. This is the one that was commissioned for our bride and for us at the wedding of the Lamb. There's an indescribable beauty in union in two beings forming one new being, entering each other's world, surrendering each other's selves. Such is the beauty of union. Such is the beauty of union. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the beauty of our union with Christ, our handsome, holy, and humble King, who will return one day to claim us for himself, and we can say, I do, for eternity, for a life and eternity with him. We ask, O oh Lord, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as we sing a hymn of, of application and response, if you would turn with me, in, to your hymnals number 169 we will sing the first four verses my heart does overflow if you're able please stand 169 
to the bride of Christ awaiting to see their uh, bridegroom, hear now his benediction to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And all of God's people said,